are the best theme tune, isn't it? Let's be honest, it's the best. Hello and welcome to this episode of Astrophysicist Reacts with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we have a little bit of fun splitting up the science from the fiction in our faves sci-fi films and TV shows. Last month, one of my subscribers, Ian Hamilton on Twitter, tweeted me to ask if I do a reaction video to The Impossible Planet from series two of Doctor Who, one of the classics with David Tennant and Billy Piper from way back in 2006. That really was the peak of my Doctor Who watching phase, so I don't know if I'm going to remember this episode, but apparently it has a black hole in it, which as we all know is the way to my heart. And I'm really interested to see how Doctor Who deals with all that as well, you know, as a show which really sort of is on that boundary of like sci-fi and fantasy as well. So let's dive in. Okay, so straight off the bat, I'm presuming this is the black hole, so appearances wise, you know, they've not done too bad. They've got like an accretion disk around the black hole. They've obviously got some matter spiraling towards it as well, which is okay, fair enough, you wouldn't probably see that in real time. But you have an accretion disk that is glowing. It's very similar, for example, if you think about like, we didn't, this was what did I say, 2006 before? And the first image we had of a black hole was 2019. So if you pair them side by side, like it's pretty similar. Obviously we knew the sort of physics of what was going on in terms of gravity and how light would behave. So we had some predictions of what it would look like. And they've done a pretty good job here of trying to recreate that, so. That's a black hole. That's a black hole. I did warn you. We're standing under a black hole. In orbit. We can't be. So one thing I just want to say here is that you know, people have this like misconception about black holes that they are just hoovers that will suck everything in. So saying like it's impossible for something to be in orbit around a black hole, obviously I'm not even gonna address the fact how close they are right now, but like saying something's impossible to be in orbit around a black hole, not necessarily the case. We are in orbit around a supermassive black hole right now at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. You know, the, we're in orbit around the sun. The sun is just one of hundreds of billions of stars that are orbiting the very center of the galaxy where you find the supermassive black hole. There is stuff that can be orbiting a black hole very, very close. It can be on a stable orbit. In fact, all of the stuff in that accretion disk that's glowing around it is technically in orbit around the black hole. It's just having a lot of collisions. And if in those collisions, you know, one particle will lose energy, then its orbit will shrink. And then eventually it will be what's known as accreted by the black hole. It's just a fancy word for take in under gravity. And that's how a black hole eventually like takes in matter and actually grows and gets heavier. So things can be in orbit around a black hole just fine. I'm gonna see like how big this black hole is in terms of mass wise. Like, is it a supermassive black hole? Is it a stellar mass black hole? So about the same mass as a star before we pass judgment on how close they can be in terms of in orbit around this black hole. You can see for yourself, we're in orbit. But we can't be. This lump of rock is suspended in perpetual geostationary orbit around that black hole without falling in. Geostationary orbit is a weird choice of words there. So geostationary is a word we use to describe satellites in orbit around the Earth. Geo, Earth, and stationary, meaning they're always above the exact same point on the Earth's surface. Or another way to think about it is that their orbit around the Earth takes the same time as one full rotation of the Earth, so one day. And they're often used for things like weather satellites. You know, if you want to know what's the weather doing over the UK right now, then you need a satellite that's always pointing down looking straight at the UK. It's also used for communications and satellite TV so that the satellite's always in exactly the same place for any receiver mast on the ground. So that's great in terms of the Earth, but saying something's in a geostationary orbit around a black hole is a bit of a weird thing to say. I think essentially what that means is Black holes too are also spinning like the Earth is, like the Sun is, because whatever star that formed the black hole when it collapsed down, that star would have been spinning. It would have kept that momentum going when it became a black hole as well. So the black hole will also be spinning. So I guess it means it's always gonna be in the same place above the black hole's surface surface here, meaning I guess the event horizon, that sphere around the black hole that marks that point of no return where you'd have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape it. And that's what we sort of refer to as the size of any black hole. And I guess it's the, the sort of black bit that you can see here that's forming that ring will be the event horizon. 
So we do refer to the surface of a black hole in that way, but like there would be no features on that surface to know that the planet that you're on is in a sort of black hole stationary, geostationary orbit. So weird choice of words. I guess maybe they were just trying to sound a little bit fancy there. <laughs> Nothing in the universe can escape it. Light, gravity, time, everything just get pulled inside and crushed. So there can't be an orbit. We should be pulled right in. We should be I, I, just, I just want to come back to this point about the orbit. Like, if you're in orbit around a black hole, then you're in a stable orbit, the same way that the Earth is in orbit around the Sun. And even though the Sun is much bigger than the Earth, we're not getting, like, sucked in towards the Sun. If something is in a stable orbit around a black hole, then only, like, a collision with another object that causes it to, like, lose energy would change that orbit and send it spiralling down to the black hole. So if they're in orbit, I mean, they're technically Fine. I mean, there is such a thing as the innermost stable circular orbit around a black hole, that last point that you can actually get a stable circular orbit around it before, you know, any further in, you wouldn't be able to sustain an orbit. So perhaps they're past that point, but that's usually around about 1.5 times the event horizon. They're clearly not that close to the black hole in terms of the scale here that you can see, because this is the other thing, black holes, because they bend light around them, they actually appear bigger when you're closer to them than they actually would be. So in terms of scale here, they're clearly not past the innermost stable circular orbit. So if they're on orbit around it, like they're obviously moving incredibly fast in order to have a stable orbit and not have the gravity pull them in. But still, like if they're in orbit, they're fine. That's the black hole officially designated K37 Gem 5. In the scriptures of the Valtino, you know what, I've just thought, like, yeah, the name here makes total sense. You'd be like, why would they dub it a number? All things in astronomy are dubbed a number these days, right? But what I was just thinking was, like, okay, you can see this black hole because you've got what's known as an accretion disk around it. So this swirling disk of matter that's solely being eaten by the black hole. And because it's under extreme gravity, it's accelerated to huge speeds, it then heats up and it starts to glow but not just in visible light that we can see with our own eyes, across a huge range of wavelengths, depending on how massive it is, depends on how hot and therefore how extreme wavelengths you actually get to, but it'll be radiating across the ultraviolet, the X-ray, and if big enough, into the gamma rays as well. So, I mean, unless this, this base that they're on of this planet is incredibly well shielded, I mean, when they opened that like roof hatch before, you'd be looking at like, ultraviolet burns, but like, it's like a sunburn, but to the extreme with like UVC radiation, like incredibly high uh, wavelength UV. You'd be looking at x-ray overexposure. Think about when you go to the doctors and you get an x-ray, how like people are so like meticulous about shielding themselves as well. And then also like gamma radiation. So you'd be looking at like, you know, radiation poisoning, radiation burns. Think about like, you know, what happens to people after like the, the Chernobyl disaster, stuff like that. I mean, all these people that had been on this base for ages, and, you know, they'd just all be like losing their hair and stuff. This planet's generating a gravity field. We don't know how, we have no idea, but it's kept in constant balance against the black hole. And the field extends out there as a funnel, a distinct gravity funnel reaching out into clear space. <laughs> gravity funnel, there's a new one. Um, uh, so the idea is that this planet is resisting the pull of the black hole's gravity by generating its own different gravity and, and sort of like pushing it back outwards in a in a funnel, I guess the sort of reasoning they thought is like if the black hole's pulling one way, you sort of push the other way. But why would stronger gravity in that sense, in that direction make any sense? It, it wouldn't. I guess we can think about, you know, sort of the ways that this could in theory be done. Like people have thought about, you know, artificial gravity for years. Really, when we talk about artificial gravity, we thought we think about creating, you know, like a, a separate force that feels like gravity. So you think about how it feels when you get on a roundabout and start spinning or on a fairground ride. It feels to your perspective as if something is pushing you backwards off the roundabout as you spin. And so you can think about creating like an artificial force that replicates gravity through something that spins. So for example, a lot of sci-fi has used this before, like in The Martian, for example, the spacecraft they're in spins to generate this artificial gravity. In terms of like creating like a force that's almost acting opposite to the gravity of the black hole pulling in, the thing that like my brain goes to is the concept of like negative mass. So a chap called Herman Bondi of Bondi accretion fame actually, which is how we describe accretion around a black hole in the first place. He actually looked at this idea of negative mass. 
and he worked out all the math showing how it would curve space-time in the opposite way to how normal matter does. This is really hard to visualize in three dimensions. You know, Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that heavy things, massive things, will curve space-time and that's what the effect of gravity is. But we visualize it in two dimensions and the three-dimensional representations of it can sometimes mess with your brain a little bit. So where your brain almost wants to go is that like normal positive matter, if you will, curves space-time in like one direction and then negative mass would curve space-time in the other direction. But that dimension has to be outside of the three dimensions we're used to, so you can see where this starts to become a little bit of a, a brain warp. But if you work through all the mass, essentially you can have like a positive mass, or so like normal matter next to negative mass, and essentially the positive matter will be repelled away from the negative mass as the negative mass is attracted to the positive mass, and so they'll stay like tethered at a similar distance from each other, but all still moving together. So I, you could imagine that might be what's going on here. But in the standard model of particle physics, which is our best theory of, you know, the building blocks of the entire universe, there is no such thing as negative mass. Now, admittedly, dark matter, don't know what that's made of. That's not in the standard model of particle physics either. But we know that that has positive mass, like normal matter, because we see that in our observations of the universe, that it's curving space-time in the same way way. So it's not like, you know, this planet could be made of dark matter or anything like that, you know, it's, that's not where we're going to go. But this was just me trying to come up with some reasonably scientific based ideas that could explain this. I mean, they're all still hypothetical, but, you know, based in science, not on, let's just name it a gravity funnel. <laughs> that was our way in. You flew down that thing? Like a roller coaster? By the rights, the ship should have been torn apart. I mean, yeah, a ship of much smaller mass like that should have been torn apart in a process known as spaghettification. So I'm assuming that this is like a, a stellar mass black hole rather than a supermassive black hole. Those are the kind of black holes that have very steep gradients of gravity going towards them. Whereas, you know, a much larger black hole, sort of that gradient is, is you know, like spread out over a larger area of space times. So the gradient's not quite as steep, so you don't get spaghettified to the same amount where you have this like stronger gravity at your feet than at your head head if you're falling in like feet first towards the black hole so you just get stretched out like spaghetti um without that they they would have been torn apart whereas the planet which is much heavier wouldn't necessarily be so there's also something as well as that innermost stable circular orbit that I was talking about before there's also something called the self gravitational radius around the black hole which depends on how big the black hole is and how big the thing that's orbiting around it and essentially beyond this radius, that object is more attracted to itself in terms of the amount of gravity holding the object together compared to the gravity pulling in towards the black hole. That's why we have like a galaxy of stars around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy in the first place. You know, if it wasn't for the self-gravitational radius, no stars would form. It would just be one big accretion disk around the entirety of the supermassive black hole because everything would be attracted more to that rather than to itself so that it could collapse and form stars. So for a spaceship that's much, much smaller in mass, obviously that self-gravitational radius is going to be further out. It will get torn apart much more easily than a much heavier planet. So again, that could be one way of this increased gravity, I mean, not a gravity funnel, but it could be one way of like, if you could increase the, the mass or density of the planet somehow, then that would shrink in the self-gravitational radius so that it would be able to survive in an orbit around the black hole, whereas other things couldn't. This power source is 10 miles below through solid rock, point zero. We're drilling down to try and find it. It's giving off readings of over 90 stats on the Blazon scale. 90 stats on the Blazon scale, did you just say? I think that was made up, don't you? Oh, they're opening the hatch again. They're going to get crisped. There, with the radiation on the edge. Ooh, that's, that's a nice that example of spaghettification there. That. In fact, you probably call that what's known as a tidal disruption event or a TDE. So we see this quite a lot where, for example, um, you know, a cloud of gas or a star might get that little bit too close to a black hole to get spaghettified and get completely dragged around it and, and fully like stretched out into this TDE. In that process, the matter will heat up and will start to glow across the electromagnetic spectrum again. And so we'll be able to see that and follow it up with various different observatories and monitor it over the space of a couple of days to see what's happened, try and measure how much matter's got in there, how close it got to the black hole. Thanks for that. Open door 18. I've seen films and things here. 
They say black holes are like gateways to another universe. Closed door 18. Not that one. That is Rose getting confused between black hole and wormhole. And I say this all the time, but I blame sci-fi for this. Black holes are essentially, I think a better name for it is dark star. They're not holes in space-time. They're a huge collection of matter, almost like a mountain of matter where, you know, it's become so heavy light can't escape. They're like prisons for light. They don't lead anywhere necessarily. A wormhole, however, is where, you know, you take two points on opposite sides of the universe and you somehow manage to tunnel through them, take a shortcut between those points. It involves like curvature of space-time again and in, in sort of mathematically with how we would describe it, but it's not a black hole. You have to be able to go in and come out the other side of a wormhole. There never becomes a point where you get the event horizon, the point of no return anymore where you'd have to be traveling fast in the speed of light to escape it because that would just, you know, completely move the point of a wormhole. If you take one thing away from this whole video, it's that black holes and wormholes are two very different things. <laughs> He continued. <laughs> I actually really enjoyed that. It made me realize that I should really watch more Doctor Who, I guess. In terms of good science versus the fiction, I guess the good would be, you know, the visualization of the black hole was pretty good in terms of our simulations and then the images we do have of black holes. The bad, I guess, would be this trope that sci-fi just constantly goes with of black holes just sucking everything in, which is not necessarily the case. You can have perfectly stable orbits around them just fine and the time scales it would take for actually a black hole to grow are so long that you wouldn't you know see anything in a short space of time like this and it just perpetuates all of the misconceptions that people have about black holes annoy me so much like I literally I mean I wrote a book about it because I get so annoyed by this stuff just challenging all the misconceptions people have and outlining what actually is a black hole and how you can think about them links in the description if you want to get yourself a copy shameless I know so if there's any other sci-fi films or tv shows like specific episodes that you want me to react to pop them in the comments down below or send them my way over on social media you can check out all the reactions I've done previously before like Star Trek and The Expanse and the film Contact with Jodie Foster. Check those out if you want. I'll, again, I'll pop a link in the video description below to that playlist so you can check it out. But until next time, everyone, enjoy your sci-fi and as always, happy stargazing. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn something new interactively with thousands of lessons from the basics of maths to advanced maths, machine learning and AI, data science and much more with new lessons added every single month. So whether your goal is to learn more on the basics of science so that you can tell the difference between the science and the fiction when you're watching your favorite sci-fi show, or whether your goal is to, you know, learn a new skill to bolster your CV, Brilliant can help you reach those goals. I obviously love the astrophysics course, which has a whole lesson on black holes, you know, if you want to learn more after watching this Doctor Who episode with me. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. That link is also in the video description down below. Plus the first 200 of you that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. Oh, I need my AirPods. Hang on, we can't. Whoa, whoa, stop with the TARDIS noises. Stop. We must feed. We must feed. We must feed. I might want to finish work and I go downstairs. We must feed. Do you know what? I've missed David Tennant and Billy Piper. Like, you know, Matt Smith's great. Jodie Wicks has been great. David Tennant. <sighs> No doubt all the comments are going to be about reacting to Interstellar. And I don't want to. I saw it in the cinema. And I vowed I would never, ever watch that film again.